Okay, good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to what is one of three breakaway sessions that are being run in parallel this morning. Uh, the theme of these sessions is to explore the role of research, development, and innovation in modernizing key industrial sectors. I'm Shanil Devraj. I'm going to be chairing this particular session this morning. And it involves um, presentations by three very exciting speakers. I've had the privilege of getting to know them um, a bit more this morning, as well as having worked with some of them previously. Um, and, and the theme that we're going to be focusing on today is looking at digitization. We, there's also digitalization, digital transformation. Technically, those terms have different meanings. The way I like to simplify it is just understand that we have the physical world and we have the virtual side of things. And then how can we merge the two in terms of the technologies or developing technologies and applying them to certain use cases to enhance the performance of certain systems. In particular, we can look at gaining insights into the way systems operate in a way that traditionally we couldn't have before. Um, there's also looking at validating information and uh, the techniques associated with that that become relevant uh, as, as we uh, embark on this type of transformation um, or transition from one field to another. Typically, when people hear digital transformation, you would be familiar with the terms Industry 4 or 4IR. Four um, just know that all it is is simply looking at implementing tools to enhance the way we do things. And in some cases, allowing us to achieve things that we couldn't have before. For example, if we look at technologies like additive manufacturing, et cetera, it's allowing us to push the boundaries in terms of the way we manufacture goods and, so, and produce these uh, uh, products. Just a few quick administrative announcements before we begin. Uh, for those of you who are following on, hash on uh, social media, the conference hashtag is hashtag CSIRConf, that's C-O-N-F, 2022. All sessions are being recorded, and recordings will be available on the website after the conference. Only the plenary sessions uh, were uh, streamed or live streamed. And I'd like to request that everyone put their phone on silent um, in respect for the speakers. In terms of timing, we will be allowing about 15 minutes to 17 minutes per speaker for their presentation, and then a short question session, uh, question and answer session thereafter. I'd like you to please reserve questions for that, uh, questions and comments for that session. Um, and our first speaker this morning is uh, Gerard Khrieff, the Divisional Manager for Process Management and Control at Editron. He's a chemical engineer by training and has 10 years experience in the production of pharmaceuticals. He has a passion for manufacturing execution systems and manufacturing operations management systems. Over the past 25 years, he has built a reputation in this field and published various articles about MES and MOM. Um, he's also published a book, uh, a number of white papers. What I'm really excited about for this about this individual is the fact that he brings a wealth of experience from an industry perspective. It's nice to talk about digital transformation and little solutions that we think will work, but here we have somebody who understands what the pain points of industry are and can tell us, listen, this is a nice concept, but these are the challenges you're going to be experiencing. So uh, his presentation is titled Digital Transformation and 4IR Technologies and Their Contribution Towards the Reindustrialization of South Africa's manufacturing industries. Let's give our attention and a warm reception to our first speaker. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, great introduction. So as stated, uh, I've been working in the manufacturing industry, various industries within that sector for the past 25 years or 35 years. Uh, that's why I'm gray. And uh, that's for my sins, staying up late at night, etc. cetera. Um, what I'm going to talk about is digital transformation. There we go. So firstly, why are we talking about using fourth industrial uh, revolution technology to help us enhance manufacturing in South Africa? So there's a number of challenges I want to see which one is the right, right button to press. All right, so this is the right button. All right, so what are the challenges? We've got various challenges in South Africa. 
some of our challenges are unique to Africa and South Africa, and some of our challenges are kind of global challenges that we have to contend with. So in South Africa, there's always a need to operate more efficiently. We've got energy challenges. So how do you run a factory if you're not sure about your energy supply? If, you're having, if you have a furnace that needs to run at 400, 800 degrees centigrade that uses a lot of power and the power goes out, what do you do? All the product in your furnace goes bad, you have to rework it. Um, so that's a major issue. We've got supply chain challenges. If you want to buy technology today that you use in automating a factory, some of those things have lead times up to 18 months. So that is a challenge that we're currently sitting with in South Africa. We also have market pressures where people want to get different things faster. So cell phones, I see there's a number of people with cell phones out. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the picture. Um, but cell phones, new versions come out every six months. Why? Because people get bored easily. Right? They want the new stuff. Right? And, and that makes it difficult for manufacturing facilities because you constantly need to change your manufacturing facility to accommodate new things. We've got legislation in South Africa, environmental legislation, labor legislation, etc., and we have to comply with that. All of those things provide us with a need for information, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So we need information that will help us make better decisions so that we can improve our efficiencies. Challenge in South Africa, we do not have a locally developed manufacturing operations management application or solution. And that's one of the things that we're working with uh, the CSIR on. Um, we have an aging workforce. This is not South African. This is a global phenomenon. The baby boomers are all retiring. And the people that need to take over from them is just not there. That is a challenge. So how do you de-risk that? And we'll go into that a little bit later as well. And then the scarcity of experience resources. Because the old people are retiring, like some of my friends up front here. So if the old people are retiring, who's going to take over from them? The experience walks out the door the day they retire. So how do you retain that information, how do you retain that experience within your facility so that the facility can actually continue? Which brings us to the reason why should we adopt smart manufacturing technology or Industry 4.0 technology? There's five reasons that specifically small, medium enterprises need to adopt new technology. First one, to get a competitive advantage. We are competing against China. They make it, put it on a ship, get it here for cheaper than we make it. So we need to make our stuff faster, more efficiently, so that we can actually compete with them. We need to make decisions based on information. Now, in a lot of smaller companies, uh, your third-tier automotive supplier, component supplier companies, um, you know, people that make roof struts, etc., the smaller type of companies that don't have lots of money, they still need something to help them get the information so that they make the right decision at the right time for the right result. We also need to capture the manufacturing information so that we have a single version of truth. We don't have lots of paper, and you know, if, I, if somebody writes a 2 and I read it as a 7, it can have a major impact from a quality perspective, from a raw material ordering perspective, from a delivery perspective. It does make a difference. In a lot of companies, when you talk about manufacturing execution systems, MES, it, they see it as Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Right? The problem with Microsoft Excel spreadsheet is that it is open for manipulation. You can go in and change the numbers. You don't like the number because the, the number makes you look bad as a, as, a, as a department head. You can go and change the number. 
then you don't look that bad, right? So we, we want to kind of move away with, from that, provide that single version of the truth so that everybody works from the same set of numbers. Then we talked about risk mitigation and de-skilling of the operation. So what, what do we mean there? Because we have the people retiring that had 20 years of experience and they can look at something and know it's wrong or they can listen to something and know that something's wrong and what to do about it, those guys are gone. So how do we take that and we put it into a system? So we take that learning, we take that experience, we make it available in an app so that anybody that's less skilled and less experienced will know the same things that they did so they can make the same decisions. We do that with augmented reality, for instance, where you have glasses, where you look at a piece of equipment um, and overlaid over the piece of equipment is, for instance, the CAD drawing or the 3D model of that piece of equipment. And then it tells you, you have to turn this thing anti-clockwise. So you can have technology assisting less skilled people to do skilled work. And that's some of the things that we can do locally that will enable us to build and drive uh, our economy. And all of that is the intent to improve profit margins. We, if we do not make profit in a company, the company will not continue to operate, and then we will have to import everything from Korea and China and Vietnam and those places. Okay? So why do we do this? Because we want to create competitiveness. We want to be competitive without necessarily having government protection. Because that's, if you, if you listen to the economic views all over, government protection is something that, I'm not saying it's bad, right? But people are always complaining about that, right? Because it's anti-competitive. And we want to get out of that mold. So we say, well, we don't worry about anti-competitiveness. We don't worry about government protection. We can stand on our own two feet as a manufacturing industry and deliver what we need to deliver. You can see there's a lot of things that kind of are the goals, but that for me is the most important one. How do we continue, even now post-COVID, and COVID basically showcased our vulnerability because a lot of companies went under during COVID because they could not recover after short period or a short period of being down and there not being any sales. Right? It just means that we cannot compete with the guys from overseas. That's one of the things that we need to, that we need to look at. So what is a smart manufacturing facility? If you look at a typical manufacturing facility, you've got your product design on the one hand and you've got your people uh, making or designing the product uh, your people selling the product, and then the design goes into the factory. So we've bought the raw material, goes into the factory, it goes into this big black box. And three weeks later, out pops a product at the other end. Inside, we're blind for whether it be three hours, three days, three weeks, or three months. But we don't know where that product is. So we need to go from there to a situation where we actually can track inside our factory what is actually happening so that we can make the correct decisions. So if there is a schedule change, if an order is cancelled, how do we react in our factory? How do we get the information in our factory so that we can change our production schedule? These seven things are that kind of keeps everything synchronized, the people, the processes, the information. So it needs to be secure. If the owner of the business is sitting in his holiday home in Clifton, on Clifton Beach and he wants to see what's happening in the factory on his cell phone, he needs to be able to do that but in a secure manner so that, they, so that the, he does not get ransomware attacks on his cell phone. It needs to be a flat structure. 
So not a big hierarchy where you go from the plant floor through seven levels before you actually get to the CEO cell phone. It needs to be interoperable. So all your solutions need to work together in an easy way so that they also change, be able to change as the need arise. You're not going to get something that works for everybody, one application that does everything for everyone. That application does not exist. Therefore, you need to ensure that the applications or the systems that you put in can actually talk to one another. It needs to be proactive. So in addition to looking at what's happening on the plant floor, you also need to say, well, if this continues, what's the end result going to be uh, three hours from now? Am I going to still be making good quality or am I uh, moving towards the bad quality? Uh, it needs to be orchestrated so that everything works together in a systemized way. And it needs to be agile, like I said. If there's a change, the systems need to be agile to change based on the circumstances. And then it needs to be sustainable. Not something that is only going to last a year and then everybody will forget about it because it's not working as it should. All the stuff at the top will provide sustainability. So from a digital roadmap perspective, there's something called the digital compass. So why are we doing this? We're not doing this to implement systems. That's not the objective. The objective is to provide value drivers for our specifically small medium enterprises in the country so that they can compete, so that they can become better. So time to market, supply demand, uh, asset utilization, labor, inventions, etc. All those things can be a driver for any specific company. Right? So one or more of those can be the primary drivers. And we need to be able to support those. How do we do that in a small, uh, small medium enterprise in South Africa? Now, there's certain components that provide that ability. So this is where you need to start. Equipment performance monitoring. So... When you calculate overall equipment efficiencies, uh, you're looking at things like throughput versus plan, downtime or availability of the equipment to operate right, versus the total available time for that piece of equipment, and you're looking at the quality percentage of the products that I produced, what percentage is good quality. So that's where you start. Now, to do that, provides you with some things, but to do that also needs some things, right? So when you put in a system like that, what you get is also downtime monitoring. So you know when the machine is down. When it's running, when it's available to run, so it's got power on, but you're not producing, right? And then when it's producing. If it's down, then you need to know why is it down. Is it a mechanical failure, electrical failure, is it an operator failure? Is it an upstream blockage? Is it downstream blockage? Why did the machine stop? Because that then provides you the information to make the right decisions. Where do I need to spend money to maintain this piece of equipment? The next thing that you need is your planning and scheduling. What is that piece of equipment going to make? Because if you have a, if you have a bottling line that bottles Coca-Cola and it only bottles 500 milliliter Coca-Colas every day, 365 days a year, you don't necessarily need to schedule it. But most of our manufacturing facilities does not have that luxury. They need change over between products. And if you use the same machine to make multiple products, your tech time actually differs. So the time it takes to make one unit differs. So we're making product A, we can make 60 a minute. If we're making product B, we can make 120 a minute. So when you want to calculate your efficiency, you need to know, are we actually aiming for 100 a minute or for 60 a minute? That 
is provided by your scheduling solution. What is supposed to be happening on this machine at a specific time uh, or a time in, in a day? If you have those, you can then also start looking at your materials. So the genealogy of my product. What raw material did I use? On what machine did I make it? Who is the operator that actually made this? What's my quality associated to this? And if and it sounds simple, but if you have a facility where you have where you have 180 processes be before you get to a final product, this becomes a bit difficult. And in a lot of cases, we're getting pressures from clients in Europe and in the Far East that says, well, we'll give you the contract provided you can show us the genealogy of the final product. What raw material did we use? What processes went in there? And what the quality results are associated to each one of those processes? And that's important. So that's why that is important. And from your OEE system or for your equipment performance management system, that information becomes available. With that, obviously, comes your quality management and reporting. So what quality am I producing? At what percentage am I producing it? Can I prove it? Do I have electronic records that is easily accessible and that I can disseminate easily? Or do I need to go to archive, scratch through them, and then not find that one specific one that I'm looking for? Which always happens in an audit. Right? You always, they always pick the one where you don't have the records. That also then helps us with our inventory tracking and our warehousing, because we know what's in the warehouse. So if we electronically can say that I move product A from production into the warehouse, I can immediately sell that product A. If I first need to take product A, fill in a piece of paper and say I made 10, give it to somebody that types it into the warehouse solution and says we made 10, and then kind of get the quality people to release it and say, well, now you can sell it. It's two days later. You may have missed the order. All of this can then also help us in terms of efficiency and sustainability to improve our material accounting, material balance, our mass balance, right? So we put in 100. We got 80 out. Where did the rest go? <coughs> um, so before any company needs to take on a journey like this, uh, there's seven questions. Where are we now? So where, do we need to change? Okay. Where do we want to go? So currently we're doing everything on paper. We want to go digital. Or if we're doing everything in Excel, we want to go to a specific application. Um, what strategies do we need to follow to get where we want to be? Uh, why do we need to change? And I think hopefully I've uh, explained that one uh, reasonably well. Um, by when do we need to do it? <clears throat> right. So when is that, and for the manufacturing facilities out there, when's our time going to run out? When will our government protection actually fall away? And when will we become uncompetitive on the world market? We need to act before that actually happens. Where should we start? Uh, you can start with CSIR. Um, they've got some good um, things in progress. Uh, and then how do we know that we're doing the right thing? And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for that, uh, Herat. We'll leave it open to, in terms of time just for one question or comment. Can I get a show of hands for see somebody put their hands up immediately there? Uh, so, so the mic in front of you, uh, you pick it up and you press the green button and then you can speak into it. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, when, when, you when, you when, you when, you when you started your presentation, you mentioned some of the challenges uh, that we're facing in Africa, you mentioned an aging workforce as one of the challenges that we're facing. But when I looked at some of the uh, solution or mitigation strategy that you outlined, they seemed more like you, how to deal with the effects of that 
instead of dealing with the causes of it. As you know, and I'm sure this is where this came from, the life expectancy in South Africa is quite low as compared to the global average. Um, are there any solutions that you can propose from a technology point of view uh, or scientific point of view to ensure that we increase our life expectancy to at least meet the average uh, globally? Um, sorry, I didn't quite catch the last bit of the, of the question. Yeah, sorry, could you repeat oh, okay. that? <laughs> The Sorry question about that. is, um, okay, so our life expectancy in South Africa yes. is quite low as compared to the global average. I mean, expectancy is uh, for the people that are born in 2020, it is predicted that males will, be, will go up to 61 years old and then females 68 years old. Yeah. And the global average is at 73 years old. So I'm saying, given, given the advancement in technology and science, what, I, what would be your proposal in terms of technology to deal with the causes, not just the effects? Because what, you, what I saw there, and maybe I didn't understand it properly, is you talking about now we're moving the wisdom and knowledge from the old people to the young people. We're centralizing all of this information yeah. so the youth can benefit from it. But it is it comes through as if dis disregarding the aged and just concentrating on the youth. OK, yes. Um, just in, in response to that, um, the reason why male uh, don't, males don't li live as long as females because they want to die when they're old. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so um, jo jokes aside, so it's actually an interesting question, um, you know, from a technology perspective. And, you know, one of the reasons why I would actually say as a continent, our life expectancy, in my opinion, uh, is lower than Asia, for instance, and obviously uh, the first world countries, um, is our unemployment figures. Right? So we don't have the right nutrition. It's not about medicine and technology. It's about nutrition. It's about opportunities. Um, and it's about the will to live. Right? If you're tired because you've worked all your life, and you retire, and in a lot of cases, people just die, right? Because they don't have anything to occupy their minds. So that's, but everything builds up. So the nutrition, the education, the ability to do productive work that provides self-worth or contributes to longer life, to a longer lifespan. So that's the, that's the root cause. We need to ensure that we actually give people proper jobs and provide work. The only way we're going to do that is if we are competitive and we can compete on the world market and in the world stage. If we, don't do, if we can't do that, we're not going to overcome that problem. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you.